Welcome back, fellow listener, again here with a red light. Uh, last time we end Wokip, the first novel of Dungeons and Dragons and the world of Greyhawk. Then, today, we begin another uh, book, a particular book. But before, let's continue our history of uh, the setting of Greyhawk inside Dungeons and Dragons. <coughs> I take another time on my Wikipedia page on Greyhawk. <laughs> and I reprise my reading where, the, where we interrupt the last time the first Greyhawk novel okay <clears throat> then in 1975 Gygax and Kunz Published, published a booklet called Supplement 1 Greyhawk. Ah, wait a second. I have, uh, I'm waiting a work call. So if someone called me when I, uh, while I'm doing this, uh, this live, I have to answer because it's work. Uh, mm, it's a brief intermission. You can take a snack <laughs> in the meantime, but uh, it's work, so I have to answer. Okay, so I I continue the the reading. Uh, in 1975, Geiger Senkunz published a booklet called Supplement One Greyhawk, an expansion of the rules for Dungeons and Dragons based on their play experience in the Greyhawk campaign. Also. It detailed new spells and, char and character classes that had been developed in the dungeons of Greyhawk. It did not contain any details of their Greyhawk campaign war. The only two references to Greyhawk were an illustration of a large stone head in a dungeon corridor titled The Grand Stone Face uh, in Enigma of Greyhawk and mention of a fountain of the second level of the dungeons that continuously issued an endless number of snakes. The 2004 publication of 30 Years of Adventures, a celebration of Dungeons and Dragons, suggested that details of Gygax's Greyhawk campaign were published in this booklet, but Gygax had no plans in 1975 to publish the tales of the Greyhawk world, since he believed that new players of Dungeons and Dragons would rather create their own worlds than use someone else's. In addition, he didn't want to publish all the material he had created for his players. He thought he would be unlikely to recoup a fair investment for the thousands of hours he had spent on it. And since his secrets will be re revealed to his players, he will be forced to recreate a new world for them afterwards. With the release of the Adva Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook in 1978, many players were intrigued and intrigued by the connection of Greyo characters to magical spells such as Tensor Floating Disc, Big Beast Crushing Hand, and Morden Kynan's Fateful Hound. The, the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master Guide, released the following year, also made references to the dungeons of Castle Greyhawk. Players' curiosity was further piqued by the 10 Dungeons & Dragons models set in Greyhawk that were published, published between 1976 and 1979. Several of Gaiga's regular columns in Dragon Magazine also mentioned details of his own campaign and characters that inhabited his world. Gaiga was surprised when he found out that players wanted to use Greyhawk as their campaign world. In response to this, Gygas changed his mind and decided he would publish his private campaign world, but with some important changes. Rather than using his own map, which was simply the real world heart overwritten with his cities, towns and regions, he decided to create a new world called Hoert. Gygas gave only the most basic description of each state, 
He expected that DMs would customize the setting in order to make it an integral part of their own individual campaigns. His map included art Arctic wastes, desert, temperate forests, tropical jungles, mountainous cordillera, seas and oceans, rivers, archipelagos and volcanoes. Needing original names for all of the ge ge geographical and political places on his map, Gaigas sometimes resorted to wordplay based on the names of friends and acquaintances. For instance, Parrenland was named after Jeff Parrell, who co-wrote the rules for chain mail with Gaigax. Urst was a homophone of Hearst, his son Ernie Hearst, and Sandy was a near homophone of Cindy, another of Gaga's children. Uh -huh. Gaigat set out to create a fractious place where chaos and evil were in descendant and courageous champions would be needed. In order to explain how his world had arrived at this state, he wrote an outline of, the, of a thousand years of history. As a military history buff, he was very familiar with the concept of waves of cultural invasions, such as the peaks of the Great Britain being invaded by the Celts, who were in turn invaded by the Romans. In creating a similar pattern of history for this world, Gaigas decided that a dozen years before his campaign began, the northeast corner of the continent had been occupied by a peaceful but primitive people called the Flannar, whose name was, was the root for the name of that part of Oeric, the Flannes. At that time, far to the west of the Flannes, two peoples were at war, the Bakluni and the Sulois. The war reached its climax when both sides used powerful magic to obliterate each other in an event called the Twin Cataclysms. Refugees of these disasters were forced out of their lands and the Sulois invaded the Flannes, forcing the Flannai to flee to the other edges of the continent. Several centuries later, a new invader appeared, the Oridians, and they in turn forced the Sulois south southward. One tribe of the Oridians, the Herdi, began, began to set up an empire. Several centuries later, the Herdi's great kingdom ruled most of the Flannes. The Herdi over kings marked the beginning of what they believed would be perpetual peace with year one of a new calendar, the common year, CY reckoning. However, several centuries later, the empire became decadent, with their rulers losing their sanity, turning to evil and enslaving their people. When the overking Hyvid V came to the throne, the oppressed peoples rebelled. It was at this point, in the year 576 CY, that Gaigas set the word of Greyhawk, as Gaigas wrote in his word of Greyhawk folio. The current state of affairs in the Flannes is confused indeed. Humankind is fragmented into isol isol isolationist realms, in different nations, evil lands, and states striving for good. Gaigas did not issue monthly or yearly updates to the state of affairs as presented in the folio, since he saw 576 CY as a common starting point for every home campaign. Because each will be moving forward at its own pace, there will be no practical way to issue updates that will be relevant to every dungeon master. Gaigas was also aware that different players would be using his word for different reasons. When he was the dungeon master of his own campaign, he found that his players were more interested in dungeon delving than politics. But when he switched the roles and became a player, often going one-on-one -on -one with Rob Kunz as dungeon master, Gaigas immersed his own character characters in politics and large-scale battles. Knowing that there would be some players looking for a town in which to base their campaign and others interested in politics or warfare, Gaigas tried to include as much detail as possible about each region, including a short description of the region and its people, the title of its ruler, the racial makeup of its people, its resources and major cities, and its allies and enemies. For the same reason, that he had created a variety of ge ge geographical, political and racial setting, he also strove to create a world with some good, some evil and some undecided areas. 
He felt that some players will be happy playing in a mainly good country and fighting the evil that arose to threaten it. Others might want to be part of an evil country and still others might take a natural stance and simply try to collect gold and treasures from both sides. TSR originally intended to publish The World of Greyhawk early in 1979, but it was not released until August 1980. The World of Greyhawk consisted of 32-page folio. The first edition is often called the World of Greyhawk folio to distinguish it from later editions. And the two-piece color map of the Flannes. Reviewers were generally impressed by some remarked on the lack of a pantheon of Greyhawk-specific deities, as, as well as the lack of any mention of the infamous dungeons of Castle Greyhawk. Game designer Jim Bambara found the original set disappointing, because there is only so much information you can cram into a 32-page booklet, particularly when covering such a large area. Before the Folly edition was released, Gygas planned to, pu to publish supplementary information using his column from the Searcher Scroll that appeared on a semi-regular basis in TSR's Dragon Magazine. In the May 1980 issue, Gygas gave a quick overview of the development of his new The World of Greyhawk folio. For players who planned to use large-scale army tactics, he gave details of the private armies that were commanded by some promin prominent Greyhawk characters from his original home game, like Bigby, Mordenkainen, Robilar, Tensen, and their axe cousin. Gygas also mentioned some of the planned Greyhawk pu publications he was overseeing, a, a large-scale map of the city of Greyhawk, some adventure models set in Greyhawk, a supplementary map of lands outside the Flannes, all 50 levels of Kestel Greyhawk's dungeon, and miniatures, miniatures army combat rules. None of these projects other than a few of the adventure models were published, published by TSR. <clears throat> Although Gygas originally intended to immediately publish more details of Greyhawk in Dragon on a regular basis, other projects intervened, and it was not until the August 1981 issue of Dragon that Len Lakof Lakofka, in his column Leo Moon's Tiny Hut, outlined methods for determining a, a character's place of birth and language spoken. Gygas added an addendum concerning the physical appearance of the main Greyhawk races. In the November 1981 issue, Gygas gave further details of racial characteristics and modes of dress. Uh, now I skip this part because there are only a list of all the articles made by Gygas on the Dragon magazine. You can find it on the Wikipedia page of Greyhawk, so I skip it uh, because... Uh, uh, I didn't want to stay he here all night. <clears throat> now, in uh, in the year, in this year, where when uh, Gaigas wrote for uh, uh, Dragon Magazine, they also published a. Saga of Four uh, game book. The protagonist of this uh, Saga of Four game book, uh, written with uh, 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 Flint Dial, are, uh, is Sagar the Barbarian, who also um, gave the name to the entire saga. Uh, they are published in uh, 1985 uh, after the published of the folio and the box set but because uh, Gygas wrote it before I think to read it before the rest so now I read for you all the four game books and after that we continue with our with our history of Greyhawk as a setting but because uh, they are not classic book, but they are game books. Uh, the reading is uh, a bit particular, because uh, if, if you don't know how a game book works, you have uh, 
a small paragraph and at the end of that you have uh, to make a choice or to do a battle. Uh, different books have different uh, battle rules. But for the sake of, for the sake of uh, our readings, uh, um, I take uh, all the battle as win by default because I don't want to stay here to uh, make uh, paper marks and, and other things. All the battles are win by default. Okay, so uh, we can die because of a battle, but we can die of some uh, wrong choice. So, uh, at the end of all the parallel, you have to make this choice. And the story changes based on your choices. So, um, let's see where uh, we can arrive. I read for uh, an hour, less, uh, an hour. Or, if I die, I die, I stop here and I came back to the last choice. Okay? So let's start the first of the four book of Sagard, Sagard the Barbarian. The first book is The Ice Dragon. Okay, let's start. Oh, it's very small. Ah, the series of these game books are uh, these games game books are parts are part of this uh, the Heroes Challenge series. So the battle rules are that um, <coughs> they have uh, battle rules on page one hundred twenty one. Uh, uh, Anyway, let's start, we begin. Uh, at the start of the, the Sega the Barbarian uh, first game book, we have a map of the north, uh, northwest, north eastern part of the Flanes. Uh, this one, not the, okay. Uh -huh. ah, perfect. This one. Ah, no, no, reference. Okay. This one, Retic, the Lordlands. Uh, Retic is a particular territory because it's set uh, between the Imperial forces, the Great Kingdom's forces, and the Barbarians' Peninsula. So let's begin. Section 1, Introduction. You are Sagard. You are 16 years old. A mistral wind holds across the icy moors, blowing back your thick dark air. On the horizon, jug jagged peaks of the mountains that form Ratic's border know at the sky like wolves' teeth. Below you is your tribal village. Your tribe is live your tribe is small, with scarcely three hundred members. You live as hunters, trading pelts for those things you need from the civiliz civilized world. Mostly, however, you shun the soft life of those who are civilized and prefer to think of yourself as the strong people of iron. A tall plume of white smoke rises from the chimney of a wood and stone building. Door opens and the tall muscular warrior step out, logging into the waning dusk. Wolves of song and loud bragging pour out after him. When the door swings shut, the warrior's lodge is once again silent. All your life you have wanted to enter the warrior's lodge, but you are not yet a warrior. Though your thews are strong and you have already reached a height of over six feet, the warriors think you are still a boy. You will not be a warrior until you pass the ordeal of courage. In Oretic, there are no laws, only customs, which are stronger than laws to your tribe. One day you will set out on your ordeal of courage. You must perform a brave deed and bring back a trophy as proof. Your trophy, whatever they may be, the fango from a death viper or the scalp of a mountain bandit, will be presented before the warriors. They shall eye them and fondle them, and you shall tell your tale. If they approve, the elk's horn chalice shall be passed to you. 
But if they feel no might in your deed, you will be greeted with echoing laughter and forced to leave the hut in shame, never again to return to your tribe. There is no set age for the ordeal of courage. Some men have grown old in the village without ever putting themselves through the ordeal, but they are not warriors. They are cowards and are treated as lessers. You are no what you are to become a warrior, and tonight you shall begin the ordeal of courage. To the west lie the records, a dark mountain vastness. They are largely unmapped. Two legends have placed strange and dangerous creatures there. Some tales tell of great treasures, others of vague rumors of a nice dragon. To the south, south is the marsh, where painted frosts roam. It is said that an ancient structure, the Lost Colosseum, was built in the ancient antediluvian age when the northern lands were a jungle, the land that now stands on its own ice covered wasteland. To head to the west, go to section 2. To take the southern route, go to section, section 50. Hmm. I don't know. Well, the gay book is titled The Estrego. So I think I go west because if 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 the ice dragon is west, it makes more sense. I don't really know. <laughs> it's it's a pretty open choice. <clears throat> I think I go uh, west. Section two. So, a living home. As custom dictates, you have stealthy slipped away from your home without telling a soul. Arming yourself with a spear, a dagger, 20 silver coins, a cloak, a skin of wine, and a flying sparking kit, necked blanket the ratic as you left. Reaching the summit of the first mountain, you could not help but look back at the small village where you have lived all of your life. You criticize, it. You criticize it yourself for this. Because a true reticon is thought to be suspicious of all things that resemble civilization. Nevertheless, tonight was the first time you had strayed far from the warm fires of your village, with, which flickered behind you like the last embers of a dying fire. The snow crested mountains glow in the moonlight as you cross into the valley, ahead of you and above you, faintly swirling like drifting smoke, is a long, narrow pass. Night winds howl and stray bits of icy snow sting your eyes. Instinct tells you it will be best to negotiate, negotiate that path during the day when vision is clear. Not far away you notice, you notice a dark recess in the mountain wall. Stamping closer, you find that it, it is a yawning cave. Stooping your massive frame slightly, you enter the cave. It is still inside removed from the howling wind. Striking a flint to spark some tinder, you create a small fire. In its light, you see that this will be a good place to spend the night. Suddenly, you hear a low growl. The hair at the nape of your neck stands up, and your skin turns to goose flesh. Your eyes scan the cave. A pure white mountain lion eyes you angrily. Its teeth are bared, and it is poised to leap for your throat. You have never before encountered a mountain lion so large. To fight it may mean pain or even death, but to stray into the night will mean certain injury from cold. Will you fight the mountain, mountain lion? Go to section 3. Or will you leave the cave to escape the mountain lion? Go to section 4. So, uh, the fight is simple for me because, uh, as I said, I take all the fights uh, as a win by default. But uh, uh, I played the game book uh, as I have to uh, play the game, that is. So in uh, my standard setting, I have uh, take the fight with the mountain lion because I'm a bar bar barbarian. I am strong, so I want to kill the lion, even if I risk the risk death. So fighting the lion. Your first battle is uh, section three: fighting the mountain lion. Your first battle is about to begin. Before starting, note this section number and go to section 121 is the last for the rules of combat. 
אז for more completion of this I want to read the combat rules so I have to go to section so okay okay cento no 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 okay okay I can okay no sorry wait a second I have issues with the the I have issues with the okay good so cento into one hundred uh, almost no. Okay. Uh, almost, almost there. Okay, go back. Okay. Section one hundred twenty-one. Instruction always uh, fighting rules. Instruction always make things seem more complicated than they really are. If you have made it this far in the book, the fighting rules should be a snap. Basically, they are common sense. When in doubt about anything, consider what would really happen. Before playing, all you really need to play this game are this book and the pencil. Some players think that the four-sided die will make fighting quicker, but the random numbers on the page will generate the combat results perfectly well. If you have gotten to this page, you know the basics of moving from one section to another. Now, all that is left to learn is how to fight and how to use the status chart. In a number of places in this book, you will encounter enemies and choose to, or have to, fight them. There can, all, there can be only three possible outcomes to a fight. You can win, lose, or flee. Win in a fight. You win a fight when you have reduced an enemy hit points to zero. Or, in situations where you are fighting more than one enemy, you win when you have reduced all of the enemy's hit points to zero. Losing a fight. You lose a fight when your number of available hit points falls to zero. When you feel that you might lose a particular fight or that the fight isn't worth having, you might try to flee. Fleeing is 50-50 proposition. If you flip the pages and get an even number, if you toss a coin and roll heads, or if you roll a die and get an even number, you have successfully fled. You may attempt to flee only before your combat turn and only on spur round. When you have fled successfully, read the flee section at the end of the combat page, and it will direct you to another page. Be warned, some adversaries are impossible to flee from, they are specially marked. If you fail to flee, continue to the combat normally. How combat works. Combat takes place in rounds and is resolved by generating random numbers from 1 to 4. The tool for doing this is included in the book. Hmm, maybe I can take uh, one d4 die? Because I have one. Maybe I can play the game correctly. Okay, and, uh, note that there is a number from 1 to 4 printed at the upper corner of each right hand page. If you look away and flip randomly through the book, stopping before you get to the end, you will have a random number. For combat, Saga that this opponent or opponents take turns. Unless otherwise stated, Saga strikes first. After he strikes, the opponent strikes. That completes one round of combat. Combat can go for several rounds and must end when Saga wins, loses or flees. When this happens, follow the instructions on that page. This will direct you to your next adventure. Every battle you fight will be different. The difficulty of each battle will be determined by how many hit points your opponent has and what his fighting level is. Hit points are the number of points of damage a player may take before he is out of combat. As Sagard, you are given 20 hit points in the beginning of the game. That means you will have to take 20 points of damage before you are out of the game. A typical battle sheet looks like this. Hey, I can, well, you can imagine it. Each time you score a hit or hits on an opponent, cross out the total number of boxes worth of damage you do on his chart. Like so. And another example I can show you. <laughs> Fighting levels, as illustrated above, are different for different characters. Sagar begins as level 2 fighter. Fighting levels go from 0 to 5. The higher the fighting level, the more dangerous the opponent is. 
The important fighting information is included in every melee, so that you don't need to refer to this chart except, except when you increase the level. These, number, these numbers, uh, there is a table. I can show you, but there is a table. These numbers refer to hit points or damage points. For instance, if Sagar the level 2 fighter gets a 4, it does 2 hit points of damage to his opponent and crosses them off the enemy charts. Likewise, if a level 5 fighter gets a 1, it does 2 points of damage. Just to test yourself, what happens if a level 3 fighter gets a 2? Uh, it's pretty simple. He uh, do 1 point of damage. If you say 1 point of damage, Yay, yeah, you are correct! Therefore, the dangerousness of an opponent can be determined by looking at both his fighting level and the number of hit points he has. Remember, there can only be three possible outcomes for any fight, win, lose or flee. If your number drops to zero, read the section after the hit points and follow those instructions. Hit points are permanent, but Sagar will frequently rest or hit, and they regain points. Regained points will be clearly stated in the book. Bear in mind that the number of Sagar's hit points will go up and down in the course of the game. Sagar carries damage from battle to battle. After each battle, mark Sagar's available hit points on Sagar's status sheet. Explaining explanation later. Do likewise when Sagar regains hit points. Bonuses. Along the way, you will pick up bonuses for your journey. These come in four forms, trophies, experience marks, weapons and armor, and special items. Each of these bonuses is valuable to you in a different way. Trophies are valuable to the ordeal of courage. The more trophies Sagard has, the better the chance he will be accepted into the tribe. Experience marks are permanent. Sagard will take them with him from book to book. The purpose of experience marks is to determine Sagar's fighting level. At the beginning of this book, Sagar is at level 2. However, once he receives 20 experience marks, he immediately moves up to level 3. Likewise, when he has 60 experience marks, he moves up to level 4. In these cases, you may modify your status charts accordingly. Weapons and armors are valuable for combat and will give Sagard an edge when fighting. The value of these weapons will be explained when the weapon is awarded. Special items serve their own pur purpose. Some special items, such as shields, can be used to absorb hit points. Others, such as magic potions, can be used to restore hit points when Sagard needs them. Bonuses and combat results are recorded on the Sagard status chart. Each time Sagar is involved in combat or regains hit points, update his status sheets. Sagar starts out with 20 hit points. Suppose he loses 8 of them, he is left with 12. Then let us say he hits and regains 5 hit points. In the next session, he now has 17 hit points. Next time you go into battle, you will remember how many hit points you have and modify your status sheet accordingly. Remember, Sagar may never have more than 20 hit points. Now, <clears throat> I think I can play it. So, no, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. what happened? I, 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 I exit from the book. That's not good. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I can play this. So. Okay, so against the mountain lion. I utilize a hop for the rolling of the d4. I have one in the phone because I play the Dungeons and Dragons with my friends, so I have an app for the rolling of, for rolling a die, a dice. And uh, for the status charts, uh, I take a notepad in the phone. So I play because uh, it seems uh, pretty Mm, easy. Oh, wait a second, I take all my recording. <clears throat> so, 20, 20, 20. Okay. So, the battle with the moon, mountain lion. No, uh, no, I want to. Okay. I call the notepad Sagard. Not Sarah, Sagard. Okay, the Barbarian, okay. 
Okay, let's start. So level two sacred against the level two mountain lion. So I have first to launch, launch the. Okay, okay, okay. Ah, this is the resulting of dice. Okay, so I take my app. My app. Where are you? Here. Oh, loading time. Sorry. <clears throat> so, Sagar begin. Roll my d4. Come on. Ah, it is them. So, <clears throat> roll my d4. And I take uh, two, one damage to the mountain lion. Then he go to. Now it's uh, his turn. And. Uh, Served three. I hate myself. Sagar take one damage. I hate myself. I roll again. Sagar now four. Two damage to the mountain lion. Three in, three in total. He's there. Okay. He missed. It miss. Another damage. He goes to six. Ouch. He missed. He missed again. Another one damage, he go down to five, I am 19. Now another two damage to, to him, he's gone down to three, I am still 19. And he make one damage to me, 18 to Sagart. Another damage is two from the death. He missed, again. <coughs> Four, another two damage and is that. Second win. I have 18, uh, 18 life point, hit point. Yeah. 18, 18 HP. Okay. <coughs> so I win. Uh, you have beaten the mountain lion. Go to section eight. I go to section eight. And do, 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 do. another half. <coughs> the Mountain Lion's Cave, Section 8. Not only did the Mountain Lion provide you with his skin as a trophy, I have to sign it. Wait a sec. Oh. <coughs> Damn technology. Mountain Lion skin. Okay. <coughs> But he also left a fresh rabbit kill in the corner. Using scraps of wood in the cave to build a small fire, you cook and devour the rabbit and have a soft sleep on the mountain lion skin. <coughs> Add the mountain lion spelt to your list of trophies. I have, uh, I have do it before. Okay. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the kill gained you two experience marks. 2 XP, 24 the level 3, 2 XP, okay, <coughs> the food and rest restore 6 hit points, so I return to 20, good, mm -mm. you awaken the following morning and hid up the path that had seemed uncrossable the night before, at nightfall, you, fi you find yourself in a fertile valley, pitch camp, and sink into a deep sleep. Go to section 12. I go to section 12. <coughs> ah, section 12. Shadow in the mist. Section 12. Your barbarian instincts bring you suddenly awake from a deep, soothing sleep. Stilling your nerve, you lie still, lightly breathing, but through your partially opened eyes, you see a human shape hovering over you. Your nostrils detect a soft scent of perfume, and you imagine a beautiful woman, but you know not to rely on scents from civilization. The scent could also be that of a Medician trader, who will just as soon kill you as talk to you. Your hand creeps stealthily to the shaft of your spear. You don't know whether the figure in the mist is friend or foe. You can try talking to the figure, but if the shadow in the mist has evil intentions, you will lose all adventure of surprise. 
You may strike at the figure, but you will risk damaging a potential ally. Mm, I think I try to talk because I hate to strike first. Uh, there is always a potential potential ally in the mist. So I think I go with the talk. <clears throat> Talking to the shadow creature, section 14. With your spear in hand, you sit up. What disturbs, what disturbs my sleep? You call on your toughest, most manly voice. The figure jumps in the light of dawn. You see that it's a Ratican girl. Like yours, her hair is dark and her eyes are blue. She is very pretty and about your age. You were wise not to attack her. Hehe. <laughs> I, I know it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so go to section 20. I go to section 20. Uh, loading time. <laughs> section 20. The Ratican girl. Hmm. Uh, things are pretty interesting. I am Glanda, girl of Ratic. Like you, I am undergoing my ordeal of courage. And what item do you seek? You ask. Eat with me and I shall tell you. She says, beginning a fire. Together you hit. Food brings back your strength. You regain 10 hit points, but I don't need it, so. After dinner, Glanda says, I intended to bring back the hurt of the ice dragon. Hmm, you log hurtily. No man has ever attacked the ice dragon and lived. Certainly, a young girl could not do it, you say. Many warriors have died trying to accomplish the task. Ah, masculist. They intended to use strength. I shall use guile and speed. Journey with me. You are uh, you high hair. She is a beautiful young girl on an epic mission. One side of you wants to go with her. The other tells you that trying to steal the heart of the ice dragon is the pinnacle of foolishness. But because the game book is called the Ice Dragon and this is the title of the game book, I think I go with her because I'm curious. So, if you wish to journey with her, go to section 21. And I go to section 21. Section 21, plotting the mission. It is said that the Ice Dragon Slayer is in a temple built by the ancient Gondorians. Glanda begins. You chuckle. I have never heard of a dragon living in human habitations. Nor have I, she says. Her voice drops to a low whisper. I have an idea, but you must promise me that you will never repeat what I am about to tell you. You don't have to worry, they will look at me if I did, you answer. Hey, Luco! Ah, wait a second, they will ring at the, at the door. I have to return. A second, I will do. Hey Raya, another 10 minutes I think uh, After that we go in the first uh, Ah! My, my face and We go in the first break of this series I don't know if you... I forgot that I take out my fo mi microphone, so I don't know if you heard me or not, but I hear me, anyway. Um, a look of heart crosses her face. Then you promise me that you will never tell anyone that you are searching for this place. Get on with it, you say. I don't want to be here until summer making promises. She watches you, her expression frozen. I promise, you answer with a shrug. I believe that the Gondorians brought the ice dragon to that building. For what purpose? I haven't figured that out yet, she answers. But the Gondorians were a stranger race, advanced far beyond any civilized races of our time. And how do you intend to find this lair? Glenda smiles mysteriously. I have some notions about where it might be. You mean you don't know where it is? You ask. No, 
But if we look hard enough, we'll find it, she says cheerfully. Your adventure continues in section 65. Yes, so I have to go to section 65. It's a pretty distant section. <clears throat> uh, this is section uh, 59, 60, 62, 65 with Glenda. Your heart flutters as you look into Glenda's pretty eyes. I could think of, no and of nobody I would rather find the ice dragon with, Sagard, she says. Then let us depart, you say. Unfortunately, I do not w could know where it is, she says, smiling. Your spirits drop. The best quest of your life and this girl doesn't even know where to take you. You ponder this for a moment, until a voice cuts through the morning mist. Glenda, I have been searching all over for you. You whirl around to see your ticking boy. He doesn't seem to notice you as he steps toward Glenda. How dare you follow me, she says. This is my quest, she says, hands on hips. He stiffens. Who is he? he asks, pointing at you. I am Sagard. I have just met her this moment, you say. Then you will take no offense if I ask you to leave, he responds. But Sagard has agreed to join me in searching for this ice dragon. Then he will do so over my frozen corpse. The Vertican boy draws his sword and faces you off. You can either fight or make a graceful exit. In this issue, you are of two minds. The test of manhood is supposed to be a solo mission, and yet Glenda has created a strange feeling in your chest. The feeling is soft and warm, and you want to be, be close to Glenda. You fight this feeling for a moment because it seems dangerously like magic. If you are willing to fight the Reticum boy, go to section 77. Uh, 67. If you would like to live gracefully, go to section 66. Well, I want the, the P word. <laughs> Because um, she is a pretty girl and uh, curly, he feels for her. So I think I go for the fight, <laughs> I think. So 67, maybe now I die. Oh, Section 67, fighting the Vatican boy. You draw your sword. Clenda steps over to a rock to watch. You are madly annoyed that she will take such a passive role. Nevertheless, you are forced to deal with another sweeter. He is uh, almost as tall as you. You must flip the page. If the result is even, you attack first. If the result is odd, he attack first. Hmm. I make a roll of dice because I can flip the pages of the ebook. Clearly. It's pretty complex. So I make a roll of dice. It is pretty strong and uh, have a lot of hit points. Yeah. So roll. No, not this one. This one. Roll. No, this. Roll. Okay. Odd. You start first. Fuck. But he missed. Ah, <laughs> lucky me. Uh, roll, roll, roll. One damage to the boy. So he go down to 14. And he make one damage to me, so I go to 19. He, I do two damage to the boy, so he go down to 12. And he answers with one other damage to me, 18 to 12. Now, he missed. I make another two points. When the 18, so 18 to 10. Ouch! Uh, 16 to 9. Ouch. Missed. 16 to 8. Seventeen to six. Seventeen. Seventeen to five. Sixteen to four. He missed a lot. Sixteen to three. Fifteen, fifteen to two. 
e mi si è lot 15 to 1 oh oh Fourteen to zero, so I win, but I take six damage. Ouch! Sixteen is my new HP. Sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. You have been uh, sorry. You have defeated the Vatican boy. Go to section sixty-eight. Section sixty-eight, beating the Vatican boy. You raise your sword to crush the life out of the Reticum boy. Glenda, who had cheered for both of you during the fight, stand up and shouts, Do not kill him! I love him! Ouch! Ouch! I am friend-zoned! <laughs> you wheel in your trucks and see her dashing for the Reticum boy. You are disgusted by this display. I will spare him, for he fought well. I wish him full recovery of his health and his common sense. A man of his courage should have a woman that is his equal. You only receive one experience mark for this fight, and you do not heal any wounds. You have learning some you have learned something important about the ways of a warrior. Sagar shall never fight for the amusement of anyone. In a later book this knowledge shall come in handy. Ouch. Cruel, I want the girl. Wow. Ouch. So one experience. Better than nothing. And I have 16 next, eight, eight points. Go to section 22. Oh, damn. Uh, pretty cruel book. Because I want uh, the girl. Uh, okay. Section 22. The Medician Traders. So I part ways with Glenda, I think. You journey through the mountains for two days, your body heals and you are again four hit points. Fuck! <laughs> Come on! Why? Now I'm 20 again. Why you didn't see this? <laughs> okay. In this time you have seen no humans, nor encountered any dangerous beast. However, progress has been very slow. You have not yet found a path. At noon on the third day, you spot a wide mountain path, which is not shown on any map. Map you have seen of Retic. You deduce by observing the deep rooted wagon trucks that it's some kind of a trader route. To gain distance before nightfall, you jog quickly down the path. Cold wind chills your lungs, but warm blood. Oh, sorry, they're working cold. I return uh, in an instance. Pronto? Si? Sì?
No. E vabbè, al derasca. Sorry for the waiting, here I am. So, uh, where, where I left my, uh, vabbè, anyway, it's a bit late, so I end this section and then I stop the, uh, no, I think I st stop it, the, um, regist the um, recording, because um, I think uh, section 22 is a middle point in the adventure. Uh, is a good point with for repose, so I stop here. Sorry for you are you waiting, and uh, we continue tomorrow with uh, our adventure on the mountain. <laughs> so, thank you for listening. Sorry for the wait. I think I cut this part on YouTube, but I'm not sure because I'm very lazy <laughs> and. Uh, have a nice evening. Goodbye. Oh. Oh. Oh.